the Bible says that there's a time for everything. And it has to be appropriate. We have to learn how to be appropriate. And we'll see this in just a second as we, we read. In the first verse, this is Solomon who was the human author under the aegis of the Holy Spirit, says to everything there is a season and a time to every purpose under heaven. Now keep that in mind. To everything there's a season and a time to every purpose under the heaven. It's God's purpose. So the second verse says, <clears throat> is a time to be born and a time to die. A time to plant and a time to pluck up that which is planted. A time to kill and a time to heal. A time to break down and a time to build up. A time to weep and a time to laugh. A time to mourn and a time to dance. A time to cast away stones and a time to gather stones together. A time to embrace and a time to refrain from embracing. A time to get and a time to lose. A time to keep and a time to cast away, a time to rend, and a time to sow, a time to keep silence, and a time to speak, a time of love, and a time to hate, a time of war, and a time of peace. The title of my message is taken from the eighth verse, A Time to Hate. Though I could accent in the seventh verse, it says there's a time to keep silence and there's a time to speak. And so it's easy to see that all that is written here in the third chapter of Ecclesiastes says that we must know what time it is. Is this the time to be silent or is this the time to speak? Is this the time, my title, my text, is this the time to love or is this the time to hate? And I will mention, I'm sure, that it's actually both. Time to love and the time to hate. But I want to accent it's a time to hate. Back in the 70s, I was in high school, early 70s. And there was a poem that was put on a poster. I'd like to read you that poem. The title, is, uh, title of it is, Take Me in Your Arms. And the poem reads this way. So now, little man, you've grown tired of grass, LSD, goofballs, cocaine, and hash. And someone pretending to be a true friend said, I'll introduce you to Miss Heroin. Well, honey, before you start fooling with me, just let me inform you of how it will be. For I will seduce you and make you my slave. I've sent men much stronger than you to their graves. You think you could never become a disgrace and end up addicted to poppy seed waste? So you'll start inhaling me one afternoon. You'll take me into your arms very soon. Once I've entered deep down in your veins, the craving will nearly drive you insane. You'll swindle your mother and just for a buck. You'll turn into something vile and corrupt. You'll mug and you'll steal for my narcotic charm, narcotic charm, and feel contentment when I'm in your arms. The day when you realize the monster you've grown, you'll solemnly swear to leave me alone. If you think you've got that mystical knack, then sweetie, just trying to get, just try to get me off your back. The vomit, the cramps, your gut tied in knots, the jangling nerves screaming for one more shot. The hot chills and cold sweats, withdrawal pains can only be saved by my little white grains. There's no other way. There's no need to look. 
For deep down inside, you know you're hooked. You'll desperately run to the pushes, and then you'll welcome me back to your arms once again. And you will return just as I have foretold. I know that you'll give me your body and soul. You'll give up your morals, your conscience, your heart, and you will be mine until death do us part. In the book of Ecclesiastes, the Bible says there is nothing new under the sun. Now, of course, in the ministry, I deal with everything, including heroin addicts, which this poem is about, obviously. And you hear like, well, I mean, of course, the heroin has changed with fentanyl and stuff. How different it is. There's nothing new under the sun. From the day that man fell, Satan has been in control of this planet by God's permission, but he has been in control of this planet. That's from the early 70s. I lived in, uh, or right near, a couple blocks from the largest drug neighborhood in the city of Yonkers and one of the largest drug neighborhoods in the country. I watched my friends go from marijuana, alcohol marijuana, over to LSD, then there was something called cocaine, and then before you know it, you go past the, the buildings and some of them are sleeping in there near the radiator in the winter time and on and on and on. And you know, my friends, all of this relates to one word that we're going to deal with today. It's all called sin. This is what sin has done. That and a whole lot more. Now, over the years, occasionally I've read to you this rather prescient essay written by the late Paul Harvey, the radio commentator. But I like to share it with you again because I think it is apropos to the topic that I've selected, A Time to Hate. In 1964, I was in the fourth grade when Paul Harvey wrote this, and it went through changes over the years until the final edition came out in 1996, and that's now still 26 years ago. <clears throat> but Paul Harvey wrote, then said this, if I were the prince of darkness, I'd want to engulf the whole world in darkness. And I'd have a third of its real estate and four-fifths of the population. But I wouldn't be happy until I had seized the ripest apple on the tree. The. So I'd set about, however necessary, to take over the United States. I'd subvert the churches first. I'd begin with a campaign of whispers, with the wisdom of a servant. I would whisper to you as I whispered to Eve. Do as you please. To the young I would whisper that the Bible's a myth. I would convince them that man created God instead of the other way around. I would confide that what's bad is good and what's good is square. And the old I would teach to pray after me, our Father, which art in Washington. Then I'd get organized. I'd educate authors in how to make lurid literature exciting so that anything else would appear dull and uninteresting. I'd threaten TV with dirtier movies and vice versa. I'd peddle narcotics to whom I would. I'd sell alcohol to ladies and gentlemen of distinction. I'd tranquilize the rest with pills. If I were the devil, I'd soon have families at war with themselves, churches at wars with themselves, and nations at war with themselves, until each, in its turn, was consumed. And with promises of higher ratings, I'd have mesmerizing media fanning the flames. If I were the devil, I would encourage schools to refine young intellects, but neglect to discipline emotions. Just let those run wild. Until before you knew it, You'd have to have drug-sniffing dogs and metal detectors at every schoolhouse door. Within a decade, I'd have prisons overflowing. I'd have judges promoting pornography. Soon I would evict God from the courthouse, then from the schoolhouse, then from the houses of Congress. And in his own churches, I would substitute psychology for religion and deify science I would lure priests and pastors into misusing boys and girls and church money. If I were the devil, I'd make the symbols of Easter an egg and the symbol of Christmas a bottle. 
If I were the devil, I'd take from those who have and give to those that want until I had killed the incentive of the ambitious. And what do you bet? I could get whole states to promote gambling as the way to get rich. I would caution against extremes and hard work and patriotism, immoral conduct. I would convince the young that marriage is old fashioned, that swinging is more fun, that what you see on the TV is the way to be, and thus I could undress you in public and I could lure you into bed with diseases for which there is no cure. In other words, if I were the devil, I'd just keep right on doing what he's doing. Prescient. Remember, that was written in 1964. That's an updated version, as Paul Harvey updated it from time to time. But basically, that's what he wrote when I was in the fourth grade. And there's others that you can look at. Uh, some of them were, most of them haven't been preachers. But God always has his witness in every generation. Now, we have something else to deal with, as if we don't have enough already to deal with. And that is all of the uh, excitement over Beyonce's latest song, came out just a few months ago, called Church Girl. And I'd like to just read a little bit of that to you. Some of you, or most of you I assume are f familiar with Beyonce. Her song, Church Girl, reads like this. Lord, place me. Lord, place me. Ooh, ooh, I want to be centered. Ooh, ooh, I want to be centered. I want to be centered in thy will. And at that point, we say, this is going to be a great song. And she goes on to write, I've been up, I've been down, feel like I moved mountains, got friends that cried fountains. Oh, I'm warning everybody as soon as I get in this party, I'm going to let go of this body. I'm going to love on me. Nobody can judge me but me. I was born free. I'll drop it like a thotty. Drop it like a thotty. Now, just for those of you who don't know, thought. T-H-O-T is an acronym for that hoe over there. I'll drop it like a thotty. It's a church girl. The name of the song is Church Girl. I'll drop it like a thotty. Drop it like a thotty. I said, now pop it like a thotty. Pop it like a thotty. You bad. Me say, and it's actually spelled M-I-S-E-H. Me say, now drop it like a thotty. Drop it like a thotty. You bad. Church girls acting loose. Bad girls acting snotty. You bad. Let it go, girl. Let it go. Let it out, girl. Let it out. Twerk that aspiration. Like you came up out of the south, girl. Ooh. I said, now drop it like a thotty. Drop it like a thotty. You bad. Bad girl acting naughty. Church girl. I won't hurt nobody. And it goes on. That's just the little I'm going to give you. Church girl. And then the Huffington Post, that bastion of conservatism, wrote this article about the song called Church Girl. Just two weeks ago. Beyonce's Church Girl has black Christian women going, that's me. The article reads, in part, being called a church girl isn't something you want to brag about in the black community. When you think of a church girl, you imagine an overly religious, rigid young woman who sings hymns and wears long skirts every day. Not a picture you'd associate with Beyonce, though hardcore Queen Bee fans will know her Christian roots from songs as old as Gospel Medley on the Destiny's Child al album Survivor. In any case, it was an unexpected but very pleasant surprise to see a song about Christianity make an appearance on the track list for her seventh solo album, Renaissance. We saw the title and all wanted to know what church girl would sound like. As soon as I get in this party, I'm going to let go of this body, were the lyrics I was expecting to hear. But they immediately, I was expecting to hear, but immediately ignited a feeling so familiar in me, and not just in me. Church girl has quickly become a fan favorite giving current and lapsed black Christian woman 
or women, a true sense of recognition in song. We have come, I think, I don't know how long, or rather how low, we can go on the ladder of depravity. Inside the church, well, that's the Huffington Post. I don't know how much lower we can go, and I'm sure there's probably a few more rungs on the ladder of depravity in America. It's in our government, it's in our churches, it's in, to, to some degree it's in our homes. And so I'm saying to you today, it's a time to hate. Amen. It's a time to speak. Amen. Benjamin Franklin had the insight, as the story is told, as history is told, when coming out of the Constitutional Convention, when things were all settled, the founders, as you know, argued for days and days until it was Benjamin Franklin who said, you know what, why don't we pray? Again, not a likely source. I mean, there was, there was clergymen in that room, but a, a deist, I mean, he believed in God, but he never, he never confessed to be a Christian. Read his autobiography, I read it. Never confessed, uh, never, Whit Whit Whitfield, George Whitfield was his, a close friend of his, but never could convince him to be born again. But it was Franklin that said, we need prayer. We prayed during the American Revolution and we knew that there was a higher power. That's my words. We knew that there was a, a superintending power. Those are his words. A superintending power that, that gave us the victory. So why don't we start praying? And that, my friends, began the, uh, that was the nascence of the Senate chaplaincy. Came from Franklin. But when he left and they finally hammered out the Constitution, the story is told that a woman met him and asked Franklin, he said, sir, what kind of government have you given us? His answer was, a republic, ma'am, if you can keep it. He also wrote Franklin in what is now titled Against the Constitution, though he wasn't against it, he just wasn't sure it was going to work. And in there he writes that he believed that there would come a time that the American people would become so uh, uncontrollable that they would have need of despotic government being incapable of anything else. Franklin foresaw the days we live in. Here in America we are a, uh, a, um, a nation of law. As the song says, combining liberty with law. And now we find ourselves perhaps at the tipping point of where the future of our country is going to be. And it's time for us to be true followers of Christ. And call on his aid as Franklin makes mention, and so did many of the founders especially during the American Revolution. And call on his aid to help us, or as we heard during the prayer time, in his time of judgment, show mercy, for God to show mercy. We need a third great awakening. Some, some people say there's been seven. I don't know what they're counting, but I only know of two great awakenings, and, and now I'm, we're praying for a third. That the Bible will be elevated back to this position where it belongs here, right here on top. Because it is the word of God, not the word of men. I mentioned a little earlier before this message about progressive Christianity. And like everything else, you have to actually ask each person one by one, what do you mean by progressive Christianity? But some sections are just the same old heretical stuff that we've heard before. The atonement wasn't, you know, it's not what it was. It's Tragic, but it wasn't supposed to be in the deity of Christ and the virgin birth and all this stuff. Well, my friends, that's not the gospel. And that's not the Bible. And you can say, well, you wouldn't say, but people can say, I don't want the Bible. And that's your prerogative, but it's still not in the Bible. We need Jesus. We need these pulpits like these to be on fire. And not, as Paul Harvey, again, presciently pointed out, filled with pop psychologists. 
You see, it's often not stated specifically, but congregations get the idea that the preacher is always going to tell them something that it's all really all about you. It's all about you. My friends, let me tell you something. It's not all about you. It's about us. During the communion, as we do each week, I reminded you. Right, you're glad, you're, you're glad, right, that God forgave you of all your sins, right? But you better remember that God forgave everybody else of all their sins, too. So you treat them right. Because if we don't get our act together here in the church, perhaps Jesus' rhetorical question may come to pass. When the Son of Man comes, will he find faith on the earth? He said, right before I come, and he lays it all out. We're not going to go through that today. He lays it all out, all the signs. And I continually tell people, in 45 years that I've been preaching, I have never seen a time in my life that, that is like the time we live in right now. We are fulfilling every single thing Jesus, the apostles, and also in the Old Testament uh, foretold that would precede the second coming of Christ, the judge, the living, and the dead. Just a couple of other things that aren't happening at the moment, but we hear rumors of it, like over in Israel, rebuilding of the temple and so on. We're fulfilling Bible prophecy right now. You have people... I mean, many, many of these, uh, a lot of singers, good ones, not just black ones, but white ones as well, came from the church. Elvis Presley was one of them. His father was a deacon in the church. And of course, uh, Elvis, just a little history there, he, he sang with his, his men, his boys there, every night, gospel hymns, around the piano, every night. But he didn't live it. Now, don't get me wrong, I, I happen to like Elvis, Beyonce, I don't know. But I happen to like Elvis, but he is what he, he, he was what he was. He was a drug addict. He was drug addicted. But they like to play those gospel hymns. Why? Because deep down inside, I don't care, I don't care if a person says, well, I'm an atheist, and this, deep down inside, you know there's a God. And you can, you can try to intellectually dismiss it and all that, but deep down inside, and even if you don't recognize that it's God, you recognize there's a hole in your heart that no one can fill. Amen. No one can fill. Amen. Not husband, not wife, not children, not grandchildren, not your work, not your career. It's, you, you, if, you, if you observe people, you can see it in them. They're always looking for the next thing. And then when you meet Christ, <coughs> at least I can say when I met Christ, I knew in my heart that this is it. This is what I've been looking for. And it is. And it has been all these long years. It's a time to hate. Specifically, it's a time to hate sin. Now the definition, let me just give it to you. You say, well, I probably know what hate is. Oh, maybe you do. And then again, maybe you don't. Webster's definition is to feel extreme enmity toward, to regard with active, now those are the adjectives, active hostility. Secondly, to have a strong aversion to, to find very distasteful. Now, I don't know how many of you have ever had enemies. And I'm grateful to say there hasn't been in my whole lifetime, uh, but a few people I could actually, I, I hated. But I can tell you this, the couple that I think of right in, in, in my mind right now, but what I was thinking to do to them was not, it was not good. It was a strong hostility. I didn't feel that way towards 99% of the people that I've known in my lifetime, but there were a couple. But the hostility was so strong that the thoughts of what I can do for retribution, well, wasn't good. Sin. We talk about it, preach about it, read about it. But have you come, you here, have you come to the place where you say, I hate sin? That's why I read that poem, Take Me in Your Arms. Because you're not likely to overcome anything in your life till you actually hate it. Now it's comical, to me at least, that for many years I hated the dentist. No one in particular, just their trade. 
And I had such a strong aversion to going to the dentist that I didn't. And I brushed my teeth. I want to just assure you that I, I'm, you know, I, I take showers and stuff. And I brushed really good. But eventually all the neglect of not having you know, teeth. And I, never ha I haven't had a cavity since I was in grade school. Not one single cavity. So I was good. So one day, one tooth got loose, then another. A periodontal disease. Now I can tell you, I love the dentist. <laughs> but my point is, no, I didn't hate it the way we talk about hate, but I had a strong aversion. I couldn't get myself to go. There's reasons. But until we learn to, and I'll give you this illustration to show you, something that I found so distasteful kept me from it. Until, and I think we need the power of the Holy Spirit to, to, to do this, until we actually hate sin, we're going to keep on doing it. And when we quote from 2 Chronicles 7, 14, if my people which are called by my name will turn from their wicked ways, until we actually turn from our wicked ways, that third, that third uh, great awakening is highly unlikely. Christian people, whoever they may be, some may be pastors as well, are going to extol Beyonce's song. We're not likely to have anything except the judgment of God. And if you read your history, biblical and otherwise, that's not good. When God decides to, to curse anyone, it's not good. Flip this verse around in your mind. If God be for us, who can be against us? Yay, for that one, I like that verse. Now let's, let's, return, let's, let's flip it the other way. If God is against us, who could be for us? If God is resisting the individual, church, nation, whatever, if God is resisting, who's going to help? No one. No one. If God is not our strength, then we have no strength. My friends, it's a time to hate sin. But before you go thinking about all the people that do all these wicked things in government and politics and Congress, I'm going to tell you where to hate sin first. In yourself. Amen. Proverbs 8.13 The fear of the Lord is to hate evil. Pride and arrogancy and the evil way and the perverse mouth, froward is the King James, and the froward mouth do I, do I hate. That's God speaking. He said, I hate pride, I hate arrogancy, and I hate the perverse mouth. He says that God he says a lot of things, by the way, that he hates. But we'll stick with these, just these couple. And if you have his spirit, then you're going to hate what God hates. And you're going to love what God loves. The righteous Lord loves righteousness. So when you hear of right things and righteousness, you're going to love it because God loves it. And when you hear of evil and wickedness, you're going to hate it because that's what, God's hate, that, that's what God hates. And you, uh, you have his spirit. If you have his spirit, it's time to hate sin in our own lives right here. You remember I told you early illustration I heard many years ago about evangelism. Draw a circle around your feet and evangelize the person that's in that circle. Because when you do, you're going to be able to talk to people with more compassion because you know what it's like to, to struggle with sin because you hate it in your own life. And your tone won't be so um, high and mighty. But nonetheless, you're still going to hate sin because sin is what brought all this on us and more to come. And that's what Jesus came to free us from. In the beginning of the gospel, according to Matthew, it says he came to free his people from their sins. Not just cover it as we, 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 we're grateful for that. He said, come to free them. Romans, uh, excuse me, John chapter 8. Jesus said, whom the Son sets free is free indeed. Amen. But he's talking about being a slave to sin. Read, read, the, read the context. That's what he's talking about. Whoever commits sin is a slave to sin. 
But he said, whom the Son sets free, is free indeed. You're free from yourself. And selfishness and whatever else goes along with that. My contention is that once we learn to hate sin in ourselves, then we'll be able to speak more reasonably and more charitably to others, but hate, hate it equally, hate it equally well. I hate it. I'm going to tell you the truth. Now, this is kind of a continuation of my little rant from last week. I hate what I see that's going on in our country. I don't just dislike it. I hate it. I hate to see what is happening to our country. I hate to see what's happening to children. I hate to see what's happening to churches. All the while, just like the people of Jeremiah's days, they applaud the false prophets. And, they tell, and the prophets tell Jeremiah, stop prophesying. We're going to kill you. Let me say something to you. Real prophets are often killed. False prophets are the ones that are raising money for a new Learjet. How, how many Learjets do you, you need? I know a couple of you got a couple of them, you got a few of them. <laughs> what do you turn, what do you? And if you're alert and if you're experienced with this type of uh, stuff that we see on television here on the radio, you know what I'm talking about. The false teachers, the false prophets. And in Jeremiah, he says, the prophets prophesy lies in my name, and my people love it so. But what will you do in the end thereof? That's where we're at in America right now. We have to learn to hate sin. The fear of the Lord is to hate evil, which is really the same thing, is to hate evil. Pride. Franklin, again, I don't know why he's coming up so much today. For, uh, Benjamin Franklin once wrote that the pride, that, that the proud hate pride in others. <laughs> the proud hate pride in others. If you humble yourself before the Lord, God will never have to humiliate you in public. And you deal with your secret sins in secret with you and God and say, God, this is wrong. I know it's wrong. Um, I'm, God, send me grace and all of this. And then it doesn't have to become a public matter. But that's why we see so many preachers brought out into the public. Because God was speaking to them in private. And some of these stories, I know much more details than you do. I've been among some of them. But they never listened. They never turned. You see, the pulpit. And I have an interesting story to tell you in a couple minutes. If, if, if a man is clever, I say man, if a man is clever, got a bit of a intelligence and a bit of charisma, he can fool anybody. Well, not anybody. Not those that know Jesus. He can fool anybody. And you can walk away saying, man, that was, what a great message it was, never knowing that the whole time he was talking about himself. Because false teachers don't come up and say, I just want to let you know before you hear anything, I'm a false teacher. <laughs> okay, so prepare. And the Bible says that they would not only be deceiving, but then themselves would be deceived. So some of this is actually, they think they're doing good, but you never see the Bible open. You never hear exposition. Verses are not quoted. We don't hear about hell. We don't even hear much about heaven. We need, we need Christ. We need Christ to light these pulpits on fire. <laughs> Preach the word. We need to hate sin. And we need to hate whatever God hates. And that is accomplished by knowing the Bible, knowing the word of God, and also by um, being filled with his spirit. His spirit. Because again, I'm sharing this with you. It's a fact of life. You get a man that's a bit talented and clever and if they want to be if they want to deceive people they're really really good at it really really good at it so listen listen to me I've been saying this for 45 years to anybody who's ever listened to me teach or preach when I started with a youth group you go home and read the Bible for yourself are you reading your Bible on a daily basis and if you skip a couple of days you miss a couple of days you say oh pack it and I miss two days or do you just say, okay, I missed two days, so go back and read. 
and read and read and read and read so that when you I had a friend of mine, he was a full vice president of the Bank of New York. He's passed up. We went home to be with the Lord now. And I asked him one time, his name was Joe. I said, Joe, I had heard that they teach tellers how to detect counterfeits by counting real money. I said, is that true? He said, oh yeah. He said, our new tellers, we put them downstairs. This is the Bank of New York in Manhattan. And we just give them stocks of real money. And all they do all day is just count the real money. See, your eyes become so... A co- your brain becomes so accustomed to seeing real stuff that when there's a slight change in a counterfeit, you pick it up. And if you become so familiar with your Bible that you've read it, oh, I can, I can listen to people say, the first thing I say, well, that's not King James Version. I'm not critical of them. I'm just saying, that's not King James. I'm saying, that, whoa, 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 that verse doesn't say that. Just because I've read it so many thousands of times or hundreds of times. So I can I get, detect the counterfeit. Then you have the witness of the Holy Spirit, and that's, uh, uh, you know, that's something that we need as well. So you, that you know the truth, and the truth makes you free. Amen. And that freedom is not just dependent on uh, how good the music is. We had two of us up here today playing. And as I said before, well, we're not exactly the Brooklyn Tabernacle. We're not precisely, thank God, the Mormon Tabernacle, but we got the job done. Amen. Yes. Why? The Holy Spirit. Amen. I've heard people with very little musical talent really bring down the Holy Spirit. And that's the truth. Very little musical talent. And they brought the Holy Spirit into the place. And some people are the wildly talented singer. I sang with one on television. I didn't sing with him. He sang, then I sang. And he actually came to me later and he said, you know, that brother, or talked about me later, that brother was singing, you know, whatever. But yeah, great voice, but don't sense the anointing. It's like the old timer said once when they asked him what the anointing was, he says, well, I I don't know what it is, but I know what it ain't. We must begin to hate what God hates. Number two. We got to hate the sin, and I wanted to give this to you, and I, and I neglected it, so I want to give it to you now in, in ourselves. Listen to this. For a long time, I used to think that this is a silly, straw splitting distinction, and the question is hating the sin and loving the sinner? This is what he's saying. For a long time, I used to think this is a silly, straw splitting distinction. How could you hate a man? What what a man did, and not hate the man. But years later, it occurred to me that there was one man to whom I had been doing this all my life, namely myself. In fact, the very reason why I hated the things was that I loved the man. Just because I loved myself, I was sorry to find that I was the sort of man who did those things. Consequently, Christianity does not want us to reduce by one atom the hatred we feel for cruelty and treachery and so on. But it does want us to hate them in the same way in which we hate things in ourselves. Being sorry that the man should have done such things and hoping, if it is in any way possible, that somehow, sometime, somewhere, he can be cured and made human again. That was C.S. Lewis in his classic Mere Christianity. He said it didn't make sense, it never made sense to me either. Hate the sin, you can't hate the man or the woman. And then you realize, and this is very difficult to detect, believe me. The things, you know, we hear Christian people complaining about, doing the very same things. And reading it in the book of Romans, it says, you that say it's wrong to steal and, and commit adultery, do you commit adultery? Do you steal? And do you think that you're going to escape the judgment of God? You're doing the same things that you're complaining that others are doing. And we, we see this. See, until we get to the place where we hate sin in ourselves. We're not likely to learn that it's a time to hate. By the way, hating sin is not the same as hating yourself. But if we've had so much of this need, uh, you know, this professed need, to build people's self-esteem, let me give you a little tip. 
I didn't come from a, a privileged family. I didn't have any white privilege. I am white. I didn't have things handed to me, little programs for me. Here, because you're white, we'll give you all this here. I couldn't go around saying, don't you know who I am? You owe me something. Oh, world, all oh, you people owe me something. Why? Because I've had it hard. But I did learn this. The more I grew in confidence in the Lord, the more I grew in confidence as a person. Because they go hand in hand. So the fear of the Lord, by which, if you haven't done a study on this yet, try it. The fear of the Lord, everything that's attached to it, both in Proverbs and in the Psalms, is something good. Long life, prosperity, all these things. Longevity, you know? Uh, it, it's, 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 uh, I did a program this week on the Oasis. You can downsize all your fears to one, the fear of the Lord. And it can't be just mouthing it. I mean, you've got to let God shake you the same way Samson shook the temple of the Philistines. Have any of you experienced that type of a shaking? I have. And on more than one occasion. When I think of what can God can do when he controls the blessing, when I think of what can God can do if he can, because he controls the curse, I, I tremble. Not physically tremble, but inside. And that's a good thing. It's a good thing. Because in the end, it builds you up and you're strengthened with might by his spirit in the inner man. It doesn't come from the outside. It doesn't come from our father, which art in Washington. My father is not in Washington. My father, hallowed be thy name, is in heaven. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. I mean, let me just... just, just Go down this little rabbit trail just for a second. I mean, what's going on is almost a joke. Almost a joke. I mean, it's not a joke. But it's, it's like something you, surreal that you would read in some real cheap novel. I think I'll stop there. But I hate it. I really do. I really hate what I see. I really hate what's... I really hate to see what's going on in our country, but I'll tell you one thing, and I'm saying this all to all of you, you got one of two choices to make. You either get, become part of the answer, or you're still part of the problem. Amen. Yes. That's as simple as that. You either decide today that you're gonna be part of the answer, stop wasting time, or you go home knowing you're part of the problem. Because you knew the truth, you know the truth, and in certain settings, uh, well, you know, I mean, pro protocol's got to be followed. I don't go around standing on dinner tables or in restaurants saying, everybody, be quiet, shut up, we're going to pray. Even though my little granddaughter last night, when she sat down, we were already eating, and she sat with her, her cousin, and, and she said, Poppy, we forgot to pray. We didn't pray yet. So okay, so, you want to pray? Yeah, you lead us. That's what you want from your children, and that's what you want from your grandchildren. She expected me to lead in prayer. I mean, as your pastor, there's many things that you can expect out of me, and you should. And there's many things that you shouldn't expect out of me, and when it comes across, I will let you know. Don't expect certain things out of me. But God expects something out of all of you. I don't need an amen or whatever, shake your head or anything, but I want to ask you right now, do you honestly think in your life right now you're part of the solution or you're part of the problem? Mainly because you haven't said anything. How many souls have you taken with you to the kingdom? I can name the ones I've taken. I mean, that I've shared with personally, not just from the pulpit. How many souls? How many souls? How many souls have you brought with you to the kingdom? How many, how many people will be there in heaven because you were the one that spoke to them about Jesus? I told you this story recently. I'm going to tell it to you again. I was, and I go through many down periods in my life. But I was in a very dark place 10, 15 years ago, something like that. And I just kept thinking to myself, I was wondering, well, why am I doing what am I doing? Is anybody really listening? Is anything changing? And so on and so forth. And I was really down. And um, my wife walked in and she said, there's a phone call for you, which when you're feeling down like that and you're in the ministry, which you don't punch in, punch out. You're just kind of available a lot. 
I'm not going to say all the time because then you'd be calm. I got a phone call at 3 o'clock in the morning the other night. It wasn't from any of you. And it gives me an option, decline or accept. Decline. I don't even know who it was. But they haven't called back. Anyway, I was in a real dark place and I was, I was thinking, did my life matter? Anything I'm doing really matter, you know? My wife comes in with the phone, it's for you, and this guy on the phone there, and he says, says to me, he says, uh, hey, Pastor Ray, uh, you remember me? I mean, really, I mean, I'm having a hard time here. What do I, mean? do I, I don't know, who, who is this? Then he started asking me to guess. I said, no, look, please. I, I don't, I really, I'm trying, you know, I'm trying to be polite. And this is what he said to me. I was in prison ministry for seven years. He says, I was in a meeting when you were in the prison preaching and I got saved that night and it's 10 years today that I gave my heart to the Lord uh, after you, hearing you preach he said I just want to encourage you that your work is you know is worth something 10 years faithful you see because God tests our faith God is let me tell you what God says to me God says to me, will you walk to that pulpit if nobody changes, if nobody does anything and speak my word, and I want to be able to say that I have been able to say to the Lord, here am I, send me. Because I'm not going to be a coward, and I'm not going to be part of a cowardice in an hour of history when we need the preaching of the word of God. I'm not going to do it. The results are in God's hands, not mine. But God willing, I'll do my part. We have got to learn to hate these two things, sin, and we've got to learn to hate evil. And then let me throw this in at no extra cost. We've got to begin to hate the imposters. Now, you, you think I'm saying that I'm hating hate the people. I mean, like the preachers. I'm not saying that. But what they're doing. We have to begin to hate when we, when we learn, because I certainly do, I hate it. When I hate when I hear major distortions of the scriptures. I hate it. I really do. And I want to share this story with you. It's actually a repeat of something I said earlier, but with more detail. You see, there are some people that are simply Imposters, they're con artists. They're conning people. And I think for me, one of the most interesting characters in history, for me, this is for me, was a man by the name of Ferdinand Waldo de Mara. Well, some of you here are old enough. No, you're old enough for a lot of things. You, might have been there when uh, Robert E. Lee surrendered at Appomattox, but <laughs> you're old enough to remember 1960 with Tony Curtis, the movie The Great Imposter. It's about Ferdinand Waldo de Mara, and I watched the movie when I was young, read up on him a little bit, and I'm amazed at what this man can do, or did rather. As a simply as a con artist. He was a Trappist monk, a Benedictine monk, a civil engineer, a cancer researcher, a PhD, which he didn't really have. He's an imposter, he's a con artist. A PhD in which he was teaching English, French, and Latin. No formal education. And I think one of the most interesting things, the movie brings this out, was when he was impersonating a, um, uh, uh, an officer who was a, a surgeon in the Canadian Royal Navy. He, he wasn't a surgeon. He wasn't even a doctor. Then they brought in some casualties from Korea. And if you watch the movie, it's, it's portrayed there where he goes into a room and he prays. He said, God, I never meant to hurt anybody. But if these soldiers weren't operated on properly, they would have died. Now, it's said of Demara that he had a photographic memory. So he goes out from the operating room into a room, and he's quickly reading about how to do these kind of surgeries. 
go back in and successfully operated on these people. Read his story. He started a college. He, was no, he had no degree. He started a college that is still there to this day up in Maine. I think it's Walsh University. And he did much more than that. And all the time, he was the great imposter. They say, once again, that he had a true photographic memory, he could just speed read and just absorb the information. He also maintained that you could learn anything without a formal education. And the way our universities are being run right now, I'd have to agree with him that it may be a better choice. I've been bookish my whole life. Most of what I've learned, I got from books. The Bible start with the Bible and everything else. What are you saying, Pastor? I'm saying this guy was a con artist and he conned some of the greatest minds in our country. Some of them were so ashamed when they t pointed out the police that he was a con artist, they wouldn't admit it. He's not. That's so and so. That's so and so. He was none of those people. Near the end of his life, his biographer asked him, he said, Now, really, why did you do all this? Now, listen, why did you pretend to be a surgeon and actually perform surgery successfully? He used uh, penicillin just to keep the infection rate down while he was operating with, with no knowledge except he flipped through a book real quick and went back in the OR. It's a true story. How do you teach French and Latin, or well, English, I mean French and Latin with no, just he would just read the books and go out and teach. Anyway, his biographer asked him near the end of his life, died at 60, why he did what he did. And at that point, he would always get a little testy. He said, I've told you before. I'm not going to talk about that, why I did what I did. But he said, come on, be straight with me. Why, why did you do what you did? And this, is, this was his answer. He said, because I'm a rotten man. The ultimate rascal. Because I'm a rotten man. Folks, let me tell you something. I would never stand in this pulpit, ever, and con anybody. Number one, the fear of God has been in my life since I was young. Number two, the stakes are too high. Number three, that's just not me. When, I am, when, a, when a fault of mine is pointed out I'm, I'm, and I see it, I say, you're right. That's called humility. That's what we need. And I'll say, I say you. I don't necessarily mean you. But there's a lot of people all over the world, not just here in America, they're calming people conning people, pretending to be a preacher when they were never sent by God. I have, a, I have a little thing here. I want to give it to you. This is a personal belief. Others could disagree. I believe that only actually God can call a man like he has, we see in the Bible. There was a man that was sent from God whose name was John. He was sent from God, not the assemblies of God. He was sent from God. Uh, that's my belief. I'm not saying we can't educate young people in the Bible and they fill the pulpit, but I believe that real preachers are, are, are made by God, just like other things. We have to begin to hate evil sin and imposters. And let me finish with this. Jamara conned many, many people on incredible levels. Academia, medicine and so on. Charles Spurgeon, he preached from 1853 to 1892, began when he was 19 years old. What's interesting about Spurgeon's story, he's called the Crown Prince of Preachers, is that he had no formal training in the Bible, but again, he was a self-educated man reading, forget how many tens of thousands of books he had in his library. And he began as a 19-year-old kid filling the pulpit of the Metropolitan, London Metropolitan Tabernacle while just a few years earlier, in 1844, Karl Marx had written his Communist Manifesto. And while Spurgeon was preaching and tens of thousands of people, perhaps millions, converted to Jesus Christ, Marx was then writing over uh, a six-year period or so of uh, his um, Das Kapital. Because good and evil run on parallel tracks. And we decide which track we're going to be on. Listen to what Spurgeon said. 
The raw material for a devil is an angel. The raw material for the son of perdition was an apostle. And the raw material for the most horrible of apostates is one who is almost a saint. Almost a Christian. Almost saved. He went on to say, this is Spurgeon, the first step astray is a want of adequate faith in the divine inspiration of the sacred scriptures. And an interesting note of history, while Karl Marx was writing Das Kapital, and then before that he wrote the Communist Manifesto, and Spurgeon is preaching in Germany, which eventually now is making its way to England, which eventually made its way here, was theologians tearing down the Bible. And they're still doing it today. Tearing down the Bible, taking away its inspiration. So let me say what he said again. The first step astray is a want of adequate faith in the divine inspiration of the sacred scriptures. One more. In looking careful over the history of the times and the movement of the times of which we have written briefly, this fact is apparent that where ministers and Christian churches have held fast to the truth that the holy scriptures have been given by God as an authoritative and infallible rule of faith and practice, they have never wandered very seriously out of the right way. But when on the other hand, reason has been exalted above revelation and made the exponent of revelation, all kinds of errors and mischiefs have been the result. We have both in the pulpit those who are just simply imposters and those who have put away the Bible Understanding that they got the charisma, the talent, the IQ, whatever, to get the crowd all excited and revved up. Send them home thinking they have something, when in essence, they didn't receive anything. I'm going to tell this story, and I'll finish with this. I'm on the treadmill one day years ago, 15. Young, young woman that I knew who was, we would be on the same treadmills, I mean, you know, the same place next to each other every morning. She knew I was a preacher, she was, knew I was a pastor, so she asked me this question. She said, uh, hey, Pastor, what, what's your opinion of Joel Osteen? I said, well, why do you ask? Well, she says, my boyfriend listens to him on a Sunday morning and takes notes. And this is a, this is a woman who has no knowledge of the Bible. None. And she said, I said to my boyfriend, why are you taking notes? He's not saying anything. I was astonished. I was absolutely astonished that someone with no knowledge of the Bible knew what I knew. No, 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 you, no scriptures. No, no, no uh, uh, Jesus came and died to save us from going to hell. It's hardly even mentioned from the pulpits any longer, as I said earlier. And so I propose to you as we go in to prayer and to finish this, that we have to start to, to hate evil. We have to start to hate sin. We have to start to hate imposters, you know, things that are going for the Bible when it's really not the Bible. And the beauty of it, once again, is that you can go home today and read the Bible for yourself. See if Pastor Ray is off the mark. See if what I'm saying isn't really in there. Well, you didn't get a lot of scriptures today. I'll make up for it next week. <laughs> See if these doctrines are, maybe psychology is the answer. But I know that Jesus Christ is the answer. Amen. And that this book, the Bible, was inspired by the Holy Spirit, by God himself. And it's the only book that he wrote. And it is, in one manner of speaking, our ticket to eternity by following its instructions. Let's go before the Lord today. Let's, let's bow our heads. Read Ecclesiastes 3 later on as well. And um, Realize there's a time for this, and then it's polar extreme, it's opposite. And what time is it? I'm proposing it's a time to hate, but not hate people, but the behavior. 
It's the time to hate what's going on in America so badly that we're not going to sit back and not do something. For us, it's got to be fervent prayer. For us, it's got to be a willingness to reach out to these people that are hurting and, and, and so on. It's got to be that every individual in this room, watching by television, listening on the radio, has got to decide, I'm going to be a part of the solution. I'm going to serve God. Not just the Sunday visit to a building, but all week long. So let me bring that to you today. And I'm going to ask you not to judge yourself, but to ask the Lord, which are you? Are you part of the solution? Are you doing your job? Are you at your post where you're supposed to be? Because if not, then you're part of the problem. Father, I know there's many, many people here today and watching across the globe, all the countries that are watching our broadcast now, and listening by way of radio that do not want to be part of the problem. Father, we ask you to pour out your spirit that we may be strengthened with might by your spirit in the inner man. And help us to, to understand it's a time to hate sin. It's always been that time, but and it's a time to love you and to love the brethren and to love others. Yes, absolutely. It's both. Help us, God. Help us to realize that our strength comes from you. As we sang earlier, when our hearts are overwhelmed, lead us to the rock that is higher than I. And we bless you for that. Change hearts. Change people. Save them, God. Save them, not with pop psychology and motivational speeches, but with the gospel of Jesus Christ, with the Bible. We need your anointing, Lord. We need the baptism of your spirit. We need you to fill us and strengthen us. Oh God, hear our prayer. And send America a third great awakening. Let it sweep across this nation. Miraculously, just like the storms of life come without notice. Let your, the wind of your spirit blow, oh God, and give us the real deal. Let the pulpits be vacated by these imposters and send us real men of God. Build your church as you said you would, Lord, and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. And in that we rejoice. And in that we, we give you praise. Folks, let me tell you, the church is not this building or that one that's over here to my right or that one over there to my left or one behind us. The church is you. You are the church. And Jesus said, in essence, I will build you when I save you and the gates of hell and all the demons of hell will not prevail against my building you. So let's stand up and give God a... Uh, round of applause and, uh, and amen.